Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granick allen I've covered C11 many times on this show, C11 being the contentious federal online censorship bill and the concerns many Canadians have with its far-reaching powers proposed for the CRTC. We've also touched upon C36, the online harms bill, where the government seeks to protect us from ourselves and the internet. But there's another new player on the scene, Bill C26. And while we are focused on C11, and C26 is something of which many Canadians seem to be aware, need to be aware, C26 is a cybersecurity bill, and if passed, will essentially grant the power to bureaucrats to order telecommunications to do anything or stop doing anything that the government wants. So joining me later in the program to discuss C26 will be Mark Leftovic of Easy DNS Technologies, Inc., but now to share her legal perspective and give us an update on where things stand with these bills, especially C11, is Joanna Barron, Executive Director of the Canadian Constitutional Foundation. Joanna, thank you so much for joining me again. I know we've had you on our show before and we really appreciate your uh, expertise here. So please, could you please bring us up to speed? Where do things sit with C11? So Bill C11 has been passed by the Senate and it was a vigorous contentious debate. Certainly the senators made many comments about the bill, um, but now it's been passed. And so now it's essentially going to be receive royal assent and be brought into law. It remains to be seen whether the House will incorporate any of the senators' comments, um, but it looks like it's happening. And this is in spite of widespread criticism from lawyers, from academics, from really across the political spectrum. So what are some of the main concerns or your main concerns with this legislation? So just to give a quick primer, even though I know you said that you've spoken about it a lot, Bill C-11 is an update to the Broadcasting Act, and it purports to regulate the entire internet by way of a newly created regulatory agency or under the auspices of the CRTC. And so some of the concerns that have been particularly acute has been that it purports to regulate user-generated content, not just TV shows that are on the airwaves like it was previously under the Broadcasting Act, but a TikTok video, a YouTube video. Um, and the notorious example during the debates was, well, a cat video could be regulated. And what it's trying to do is make sure that your feed, your feed and my feed, when we log into YouTube uh, or into TikTok, that we see a certain proportion of Canadian content. And what from a logistical perspective, just seems very unwieldy, is how, how is the CRTC going to you know, weave through the billions of hours of content that are on the internet and decide what constitutes Canadian content? And doesn't it violate some basic right of us as media consumers that the government is going to be putting tipping their hand on the scales of what we see? I feel like I'm a perpetual child living with their parents, where I always need the government to come in and tell me what I can and can't do. Um, you mentioned a good point is, is, you know, again, billions of hours of content. How will the government make a determination in which suits their Canadian content-specific standard? And, you know, we hear this from algorithms, that there will be an algorithm put out there and, and what some, I guess, AI will weave through it all. I'm not sure. It still needs to be clarified. But, you know, your point, again, is a very good one. Why do I, as a Canadian citizen, need the government to tell me what I can and shouldn't see online? And, and of course, some of the biggest uproar has been from Canadian content producers. They're concerned about their income and their livelihoods. Yeah, and Canadian content creators really have outperformed in the field. We've spoken to many of them that say, look, if you look at the top 100 YouTubers, Canada outperforms. Of course, some of them are controversial and polarizing, like Jordan Peterson, who is, you know, by leaps and bounds, um, has the most popular YouTube channel made by a Canadian. He does not need the CRTC to boost his content. And of course, the question then becomes, well, will it be the opposite? They're not going to boost his content, even though clearly many Canadians enjoy his content. They're going to suppress his content. Um, so in any event, it's kind of also a solution in, uh, in search of a problem. Because as far as we can tell, if you look at like numbers by population, Canadian content creators are killing it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, is the government wading into a territory where they really have no business being. And I don't know, based on our conversation, sounds, yes, yes, they are. 
Yeah, I would say so. And I would say that it goes to our right of free expression because I have the right to curate the informational diet that I want to expose myself to, certainly not up to the government. So that's where the constitutional dimensions come into play. Okay, we're going to pick up this discussion in just a few minutes after this break. Welcome back. We're discussing a whole host of online internet censorship bills that the government is bringing down our path. One recently that we just discussed, C-11, just recently passed the Senate with amendments. Joining me for that discussion is Joanna Barron, Executive Director, the Canadian Constitutional Foundation. Joanna, you know, I want to wrap up this discussion on C-11 because sadly there are other uh, attacks, I guess I could call them, on constitutional freedoms. But Uh, With C-11, the minister, Rodriguez, who is our cultural minister, stated that any of those amendments that came from the Senate, because when they pass a bill in the Senate, they can attach amendments and give some direction before it gets royal assent. He stated that any amendment that has any meaningful impact, he's just going to ignore. So if any amendment from the Senate were actually to change some of the meat and potatoes of the law, not interested. He's not going to do it. I thought that was strange and really affront to democracy. <laughs> it's very shocking. Yeah, it's shocking. I, I can't really tell I, or, or speculate about what the government's rationale is, but they really have chosen to dig in their feet on this particular bill. And as I say, it's not about a conservative or liberal issue. Across the spectrum, there have been concerns about this. And in the Senate, which is part of the government, and the Senate's role is to provide a sober second look and advice to the House. Um, So it's very odd. And I certainly hope that Canadians will keep this in in mind whenever we go to a next federal election. Well, as we go to the next topic, what's in my mind is why? Why are they so hung up on this? But we're not going to answer that question today. (laughs) We're going to move on. We'll talk about C-36. Could you give us a short um, explanation of what that is and where does it stand now? So C-36 is called the Online Harms Bill, and essentially it brings back the civil remedy for hate speech. So things that are said online, and of course in an online context, that are said to be um, inspiring detestation or calumny. So now you can make complaints, and you can even make a complaint to, it's going to be a new tri- newly created tribunal created by statute, if you suspect that somebody is going to commit hate speech. So you can apply for a prophylactic order. And this delegates a lot of the responsibilities to platforms. So if platforms don't take down hate speech, which again, I just want to be clear, hate speech, when it exists in cut and dry terms, it's already a crime in the criminal code, Mm -hmm. counseling genocide, counseling suicide, those are already crimes. So to some extent, it's duplicative. But if Facebook, you know, if somebody posts a hate speech comment and Facebook doesn't take it down within 24 hours, the fines are uh, 3% of global revenues or up to several millions of dollars, whichever is higher. So these are real fines. And inevitably, what's going to happen, Tanya, is these platforms seeing these fines are going to err on the side of just take everything down. Anything that could be on the edge, anything that we think could provoke detestation of a group just take it down. So you can already see that it's not just the law that's a problem. It's kind of like the broader spectra specter of the law. It will create a huge chill effect. And we are extremely concerned about this bill at the Canadian Constitution. Well, and it it may very well dissuade many of these companies from doing business in Canada, because who wants to operate within such tight confines if you said 3% of global profit? I mean, that's huge for a company like Facebook. Of course. Yeah. My goodness. Okay, uh, C26, and again, we're going to unpack this big time uh, with our next guest after the commercial, but give us a primer. What's C26 and where does it stand? So C26 uh, has received, I believe now it's second reading in the House. This is a cybersecurity bill. And so cybersecurity, obviously an inc- incredibly important issue. However, this bill really got the balance between security on the one hand and privacy on the other hand wrong. It allows for the governor and council, as you mentioned in the intro, to tell any telecom company to do or not do anything. Like it's worded so broadly. But there's also an aspect that as a lawyer, I'm very concerned about where the bill allows platforms to basically refuse to provide services to people. So something happens and you can't get internet services. And for judicial review, so if you want to challenge that decision, it provides that the government can provide secret evidence as to why that person had their services revoked. So the person themselves, so if I have my services revoked, for whatever reason, you know, misunderstandings happen, I don't even get access to the evidence the government has against me. 
So I don't even have any right of full answer and defense. And normally, and this is kind of drawing from national security hearings, we have a lot of ways to deal with it. And the way we usually deal with it is the court will appoint a security cleared lawyer called an amicus curiae. And that's sort of a fair compromise because it keeps the state secrets protected, but it also allows the applicant to have some right of answer and defense. There's nothing like that here. There's no right of disclosure. There's no involvement of the privacy commissioner. So I'm sure your your uh, next guest will get into it. But this is another really sneaky, just full frontal assault on our individual liberties and privacy rights. You know, I'm, I'm in shock and horror hearing what you're saying, Joanna. And you're right. My next guest will unpack it a little bit more. But my goodness, I... I'm concerned about my freedoms. I continually am. Joanna, thank you so much for joining us. Um, We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion on C26. And to help me unpack it all is Mark Yeftovic, co-founder and CEO of Easy DNS Technologies, Inc. Mark, thank you so much for joining today. I read your your story on uh, Easy DNS, and I, I was really taken by some of the concerns that you had written there with this legislation. So, for our viewers, again, who may not be familiar with this legislation, could you help explain what are some of your concerns with C26? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Tanya. Um, C26. There's a, there's a bunch of other bills that you're you're already aware of and been talking about, and, they, and to me, they all kind of mashed together to make this really horrible package. But C-26 has been so much under the radar that it even flew under my radar for a while because I was uh, I was on a board meeting for the Internet Society Canada chapter, which I'm a member of. And someone asked me on the last meeting, the policy committee, she said, Mark, what, we were talking about C-26. What are your thoughts on it? And I, I, I didn't really have much of an answer. I, I knew about it. I wrote about it briefly in November, and then I did a deep dive, and I and I was just appalled at how terrible this is. And and basically, C twenty six is a cybersecurity um, infrastructure safety bill. It's supposed it's purported to um, you know protect the safety of Canada's uh, information infrastructure, online infrastructure, protect Canadians from cyber crime and terrorism. But it, the problem is that it's so open ended that it literally like the words are in the bill gives um, the government and quasi governmental agencies the power to direct telecom service providers, which could be pretty, pretty well anything to do anything or to stop doing anything. And there's no boundaries or parameters around what the word anything means. It just says anything that they think um, impacts the safety of Canadians they, you know, telecom service providers can be ordered to do or not do anything. So to me, this smacks um, of government really meddling in in private business. Uh, You know, telecom providers are talking about internet providers, cable providers, uh, telephone, telecommunications, uh, cell phone providers, uh, that basically the government's going to dictate you can please stop doing this or please do this. And they have to say yes. This is the law. You have to say yes. It's not only do you have to say yes, so there's even so there's these secrecy provisions in it where you you maybe you're directed to cut off a customer and that customer can be a person or it can be another company. And you're not allowed to tell them that you've received this order. You're not allowed to tell them why you're cutting them off. And um, you have no choice. You just have to cut off this this entity, be it a person or another company entirely. And you can't tell them why. And so, you know, just a quick example, like we're we're a DNS provider, we manage companies, name servers and infrastructure, that kind of thing. And some of our customers are, are cities and hospitals and even the province. And, and I mean, they're not going to tell us to cut off the province, but if they tell us to cut off another telecom provider and we can't tell them why, I mean, that can cause these cascading knock-on effects throughout the whole system. And we just have to sit there with our mouths, you know, zipped shut, we can't explain what's going on, that we've received this this secret order from the police or the government, really. And, and to me, that's very shocking. Like, why would an order need to be filed in secret? What's with the secrecy? I don't understand what the motive or impetus would be behind that. You know, it's already a thing in, in reality. I mean, we have occasionally received uh, sealed orders that are delivered to us via 
you know, our nation's um, security apparatus. I'm not allowed to uh, copy it. I'm not allowed to write detail. I'm allowed to write down the court order, the date and the judge who issued it and the domain name in question. And that's and then they just take the order away from me and walk out the door with it after they they tell us what has to happen. And usually now it's always specifically uh, scoped to a single domain, like maybe someone on a web host or something like Mm -hmm. that. That's happened maybe twice in the past few years. So this secrecy thing is already kind of a standard practice with this government. Well, any government, this predates the current one. And so it's just getting built upon existing, you know, they get away with it to a certain point. So they're just adding more on and they're adding more on. But now, you, even the person who's being cut off can't be they their lawyers cannot obtain information under this act as to what's happening to them or why they're being persecuted. Yeah, and that's that's the shocking point. And and we had a, a Joanna Barron on just before you from the Canadian Constitutional Foundation, and she was sharing that perspective that you know she was expressing that that how can one defend themselves? What happens if someone was targeted in, uh, accidentally or they got the wrong person? How do you defend yourself if you don't know who or what? the charge is against you. Lots of issues with this bill. We're gonna unpack more of it after the break. Please stick around. Welcome back. We're unpacking C-26, the federal legislation that's being proposed. And joining me again is Mark Yeftovic, co-founder and CEO of Easy DNS Technologies, Inc. Mark, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate what you wrote here. It opened my eyes to legislation that wasn't on my radar. And we're talking about uh, some of the harms or the concerns we have with this legislation. So if you are given an order and it's filed in secret, you don't know what or whom, you're just having to cut off somebody, what is the penalty for non-compliance? They're pretty stiff. So if you're uh, a person, it's a, it can be up to a million dollars per day. Uh, per count, per violation, and if you're uh, not a person, an entity, so a business or a corporation or something, uh, up to $5 million per day per violation. My goodness, that's those are steep fines. Like you really, this is a very, in my opinion, sounds very heavy handed, like you must do what we're going to ask you. There is no out out of this. Especially since you can't... Uh, you don't even have access to the information about what these these charges are about or these infractions are about. So you can't even really adequately mount a defense against it. And when you also brought up a very good point in your piece, you talked about the the warrantless entry, and I don't know many other areas where there's no warrant given for entry into business and homes to search, copy and remove anything that's deemed relevant to the the file. Those are those are almost pet provisions that have been tried uh, to be introduced into previous legislation. I, I I don't know for sure which one it was. I think it was the online harms bill that was tabled. That's currently C thirty six had something similar that it provided for. Um, yeah, warrantless entry onto premises where they can um, take or copy any documents or equipment in this case that they deem relevant and and remove it. And there's really nothing you can do about it. So, yeah, we're talking warrantless searches here. So what does that mean? If, if I'm a Canadian individual or I'm a DNS provider, then the government can come in without telling me why, without a warrant, without telling me the reasons, take what they want, leave, and I have no recourse and my lawyer can't find out why. Yeah, pretty much. And it's not just the government. There are certain entities that are also designated uh, under this act, like the Canadian Nuclear Association, if I have the name correct, the Bank of Canada, right? And so they have the same kind of like they, they can they can, I guess, precipitate or instigate these kinds of instigation, these uh, investigations and searches. And you mentioned the Bank you know. of Canada. I mean, this sounds a little bit of the fallout from the Freedom Convoy when a lot of bank accounts were frozen last year. And of course, that was under the auspices of the Emergencies Act. This would not be an emergencies use. This would be permanent. It's a law. It's a day-to-day law. That's a great point to bring up what happened with the Freedom Convoy, because that was such an egregious example of government overreach. During an ostensible emergency, they actually started seizing bank accounts before the Emergency Act had actually gone through Parliament. But this would just be the law of the land. There's no emergency. So if the government oversteps the line that much 
during uh, an emergency with air quotes around emergency, how much are they going to overstep the line when they've already pushed it as far as it gets pushed if this act goes through? My goodness. And one other thing that you pointed out in your story of your coverage of this in your blog is you said that this allows the government and all these other entities that you mentioned to share data with foreign entities. Yes. That struck me as yeah. bizarre. Why? Why would someone want to share this kind of sensitivity with foreign entities? Why indeed? Um, what, what, what it made me think of was uh, the way these, these governments sort of act as a peloton, like they sort of act in concert on certain initiatives when suddenly, oh, we're going to move against whatever, whatever the, the, the crisis of the day is. And, you know, we received uh, a request from the Ukrainian cyber police. Um, what are they called? The National Police of Ukraine Cyber Police Department sent us a request earlier this year saying, we want you to just shut down every Russian site on EasyDNS. And uh, we didn't actually reply. But I'm wondering, if this is this the kind of the thing where you know, in the future, Canada can send a list of sites to the Ukraine to shut down or to some other country to shut down or whatever other country. They won't send it to easy DNS. They'll just send it to the government and then someone will walk this letter over to us or send it to us and say, guess what? We want you to find all these sites that meet this right. criteria on your business and shut them down. There's no parameters on what basis to locate them or identify them. So... Wow. Well, it's, this is definitely something we're going to have to keep our eye on. Um, we'll have you back on, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. C26, you better believe it that we're going to keep an eye on that bill here on CounterPoint. Have a great day. Tanya Granik-Allen. Allen.